So our, our next speaker is Kevin Trenberth. Um, in certain conversations that I've been hanging out recently, um, if we did a, a wordle of the conversation, I think the word Trenberth would probably come up at the top of the list, um, which I always please you later. But anyway, um, he's a distinguished uh, senior scientist in the climate analysis section at NCAR. Uh, he's from New Zealand. He obtained his doctorate from MIT um, and has been prominent in most of the IPCC scientific assessments of climate change. Um, he's also served the World Climate Research Program and many U.S. national committees. He's a fellow of AMS, uh, AAAS, AGU, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, Kevin, take it away. Thank you very much. Mark, you helped set up a little bit of what my talk is about. Now you'll notice here, this is 229 megabytes. <laughs> so I have a little movie embedded here somewhere. And I was asked to speak about uh, El Nino and what effect it has on the global mean temperature, and I interpreted that a little more broadly, so it actually is a follow-on to Eric's talk, and I'm going to talk about uh, the changes going on with El Nino in association with climate change, perhaps a little more broadly than, than Eric chose to do. <coughs> so, uh, so that was a recent picture. Uh, here's an estimate of what the uh, global mean temperature looks like, and. NOAA just came out today and said that uh, October was the warmest October on record. Uh, it turns out I used the old NOAA record here before it was changed, and so the numbers on here you shouldn't uh, trust, but the relative values uh, perhaps uh, are reasonable. And what I've done is uh, from the September value, uh, using persistence uh, through the end of the year, uh, projected as to what the uh, 2015 record looks like relative to the other years. 2014 is here, the previous highest on record, and the 1998, the warmest year last century, very much an El Nino year, and of course, that's a big player in what's going on this year as well. And so uh, this year already is, is going to stand out well above anything that we have seen before. The value which NOAA says uh, applies for uh, January through October is 0.86, which is up here somewhere, and all of these numbers need to be uh, manipulated a little bit. Um, what I've done, though, is to put on here the value of the pre-industrial temperature, and uh, already this value here is one degree C, or slightly over one degree C, above the pre-industrial value. And given the October value, I used 0.9, and it was, turns out to be 0.9 seven or something like that, uh, this is very likely to be even a, a little bit higher relative to these other values that they've got in here, and certainly well over one degree C. So this is halfway, or more than halfway to this two degree C uh, threshold that is being used widely in, in the talks that uh, go on about climate change, not exceeding two degrees C. There's the carbon dioxide record, and the other thing is that in the past week or two, we've probably gone through 400 parts per million by volume for the last time, and we will probably never go below it again. That's, uh, I mean, there's some little fluctuations that occur, but the seasonal cycle is now on the upward swing. Uh, previously, we did touch 400, but then we went back down again with the, with the drawdown in the northern hemisphere summer, and now we're at 400 parts per million by volume, and so this is another landmark that is going on right now, also right before the COP21 meeting. So this is one degree C. <clears throat> this is what it looks like in recent times since 1970. Down the bottom here I've got uh, the Nino 3.4 record, and so you can see the amplitude there, but I've colored them in up above here so you can see the El Nino years and the La Nina years, and you can see that, you know, 97, 98, the, the large warming that occurs at the end of the El Nino events, and that's pretty much true at the end of all of these um, El, El Nino events is when all of these peaks occur. 
And so the interannual variability, the natural variability, if you like to think of it that way, is certainly playing a key role in a lot of this variability in the global mean temperature record. Here's a, a, a slightly different version of this. Uh, it turns out from 1970 on, uh, this is what, two, through 2013, um, fitting a, a straight line is, is not that bad, and yet many people or deniers of climate change have seized on 1998 and drawn lines like this, which suggest that there has been a hiatus in the, in the rate of global mean temperature rise. And so, uh, uh, and so the variability of some sorts comes into play, and so I want to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I think that's all I'll say here. So back in, in 2002, we wrote a, a paper called The Evolution of ENSO and the, and the Global Atmospheric Surface Temperatures that appeared in, in JGR. And so we've got a, a global temperature record here, and we've got the contribution to that of El Nino, uh, predicted from uh, Nino 3.4, and there's a, a reasonable r relationship there. And we concluded in that paper that for 1998, uh, the peak value was 0.24 degrees C higher because of El Nino, and the, for the year as a whole, 1998 was 0.17 degrees C higher, <coughs> excuse me, than, uh, than it would have been uh, without the El Nino. And so you can do relationships like this, and you can see uh, these are for three different periods here now, or uh, well, one of them is the, is the full period from 1950 to 1998. Uh, but it's interesting to look at these two different periods. Um, certainly there's a, a distinct idea that the global mean temperature peaks somewhat after the Nino 3.4 peaks, uh, and on average it's around about three years. It's a bit more blunted in the more recent period, and the main reason for that is because of the, uh, the confusion that comes in because of the El Chichon and Pinatubo uh, eruptions that uh, sort of muddy the waters just a little bit in the, in the nature of the response here. So maybe this is what it looks like uh, more purely uh, in this earlier period where the El Ninos were relatively smaller, but there's a very distinctive response uh, in, in association with El Ninos. And this relates very much to the idea of a, a discharge and a recharge, so that during La Nina there's a buildup of heat in the Western Pacific, and then El Nino is the process with the uh, ocean, uh, the system gets rid of that heat, spreads it across the Pacific, it goes, the heat goes out of the ocean into the atmosphere through evaporation primarily, it warms the atmosphere and there's a mini global warming toward the uh, latter, latter stages of El Nino and also in association with that because of the overturning in the atmosphere there is subsidence over the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, uh, light winds and those oceans warm up. And, and so that also adds to the warming at the latter stages of the El Nino events. So we can expect that uh, in 2015, we're going to get this bump of about 0.25 degrees C because of the El Nino uh, to, uh, to a very large extent. And so what happens, of course, is that this heat gets into the atmosphere, gets moved around by the atmosphere, and then it gets radiated to space. And so in that sense, El Nino serves part of the climate system by acting as a regulator of temperature. The heat builds up in the Pacific. Uh, it, the, the El Nino process, uh, once it builds up to a certain level, there's certain things that uh, trigger it. It may be a, a random event, an MJO event or something, but uh, the El Nino happens and the system manages to get rid of the heat. And if you look at around the world, you'll find that the tropical Pacific is where the warming in the, on the globe has been the least in, uh, in the last few decades. So I thought then I would turn to some other things that are going on in association with climate change. Uh, you know, the biggest source of drought and floods around the world is ENSO, and I've just listed here, you know, where uh, droughts tend to occur with El Nino events, and, and you know, there are, there are these kind of somatics. Which, which sort of highlight uh, some of the, these relationships. Um, the basic reason there are more droughts over land during El Nino events 
is because all of the action is out here in the tropical Pacific. That's where all of the action is occurring, and, there's a, and it detracts from action over land. And so there tends to be drier conditions over land during El Nino events. And this applies also on longer time scales. And so uh, during recent times, during this hiatus period, we've had more La Nina events. This is actually the negative phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It means then that there's actually been more rainfall over land in recent times than, uh, than we might have expected if these were equally distributed. And there's been some very confusing things, actually very misleading things that have been reported in the IPCC with regard to trends in droughts because they have not realized how droughts are changing in association with El Nino and the natural variability. Um, so one of the very fundamental things about the atmosphere is that warmer air holds more moisture. It's around 7% per degree C. If there's anything you remember out of this talk, you might remember that number. Uh, in Fahrenheit, if you prefer Fahrenheit, it's about 4% degrees, uh, 4 per degree Fahrenheit. And so warmer air can hold more moisture. And in fact, uh, it does so over the oceans where there's plenty of moisture. With global warming, we've got a little bit of extra heat. Where does that heat go? It goes initially into drying. Um, it, if there's water available, it will produce evaporation of that moisture and the evaporative cooling then keeps things uh, relatively cool. But when you run out of moisture, uh, then, then you end up with, with heat waves. So there's more evaporation and there's more moisture which goes into the atmosphere. And then in places where it's not raining, things dry out and you get droughts. In places where it is raining, the weather systems can reach out and grab the available moisture in the atmosphere, bring it into the weather system, and on average, and this works pretty good from all scales, from a thunderstorm scale to a hurricane to an extratropical cyclone, if you look at the size of the area where it's raining, and you quadruple, uh, well, you quadruple it linearly, so the radius of a hurricane is on average about 400 kilometers. But the moisture that flows into that storm is coming from about 200 kilometers away, 1,600 kilometers away, a factor of four greater. And it spirals into the hurricane. And it's true with extratropical cyclones. If you have a big rain, uh, snowstorm even in Boston, the moisture is coming out of the subtropical Atlantic or out of the Gulf. It's coming from 2,000 kilometers away. And so if there's more moisture lurking around in the atmosphere, all of these storms have access to it. They reach out and grab it, and they dump it down in the form of heavier rain. And so you get heavier rain as the climate warms, as long as you've got access to this moisture, which of course you don't in the middle of the desert. So with a different, this is just a different way of saying the same things. With global warming, this extra heating, the temperature goes up, the evaporation goes up, the water holding capacity goes up, and the atmospheric moisture goes up, and we've got very good observations to show that that's actually happening. The greenhouse effect also goes up, and we've actually got an empirical estimate as to, as to uh, what that is now uh, for one millimeter of uh, increase in uh, total precipitable water, the greenhouse effect I forget what the number is, but it's around 0.8 watts per square meter increase in, in the heating of the planet. Um, floods uh, are, are a consequence, and so are droughts, of course, in different places at different times. So uh, I want to say a little bit more about drought. Um, whether a drought occurs or not, I think, is largely caused by natural variability and dominated by uh, El Nino. Given a drought, the global warming aspects make it more intense and longer lasting. And drought is one of the times when the extra heating from the increases in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has to go somewhere. Normally, it, a lot of it goes into evaporating moisture and sort of gets lost into the hydrological cycle. But in a drought, there's no more water available. And so the heat goes into, well, firstly, drying things out more, increasing the wildfire risk, and then secondly, creating heat waves. And we've seen this, of course, very much in California and, and throughout the West. This is, this is um, 23rd of August uh, this year. And uh, earlier, there were wildfires up in Alaska and so on. 
And so the extra heat has nowhere else to go, and this is one of the big factors that's occurring in association with, uh, with global warming. So in terms of looking at the California drought, this is what it actually looked like in terms of the rainfall anomalies uh, from uh, December, January, February of 2013-14. Uh, these are absolutely huge numbers, and I mentioned yesterday that these are in association with the Madden-Julian oscillation, or these so-called westerly wind bursts. There was tremendous rainfall over here. This is uh, somewhere around 700 millimeters, 800 millimeters over here in a three-month season. So eight, nine millimeter per day average rainfall anomalies. One millimeter per day means the heating of the atmosphere through latent heat release is about 29 watts per square meter. So this is, this is um, uh, 250 watts per square meter of heat going into the atmosphere. If you look at the total globe, this is where all of the action is in terms of the dyadic heating of the atmosphere, and it has a consequence. And this is the sort of consequence that you get down here. So I want to show you this. This is a movie that was put together by NHK, and it was broadcast on Japanese television. They didn't get it quite right. You'll see the dominant heating is actually here, and then this is a, a sink, and so there's, there's a, a little circulation associated with this. But it has some ramifications, and this thing should be s sort of slightly over here, so it's not quite in the right place. So let me see if we can activate the movie. This is the thing that was called the Ridiculously re Resilient Ridge, and then this is the trough downstream, which was the very cold outbreaks in the eastern parts of the United States last year. So let's see if we can activate the movie. So under normal circumstances, we have westerlies and we have migrating cyclones and anticyclones, very schematically given heat, and think of this as the jet stream, if you like. And then we have anomalous heating here, and the first thing that that does is it tends to uh, stagnate things. Things get locked into place. And then the air is rising, and as it outflows in the northern hemisphere, it spins up an anticyclonic circulation because of the rotation of the atmosphere. And then that has an influence downstream uh, into the middle latitudes, and it sets up another low pressure system downstream, which then sets up the high pressure, and you get this Rossby wave, this false Rossby wave getting set up here. And so here we have this ridiculously resilient bridge that has been occurring and set up the blob in the North Pacific. And we have a trough downstream. This is not quite right over here, too, because this actually came right across here into the UK and caused floods in the UK. But uh, the origins of it are clearly, I think, back in this region here, where there was this tremendous, these tremendous anomalies in rainfall that were occurring. I thought I'd look at the uh, current situation. One of the things which I find, is Michelle Hero here? Um, uh, you know, one of the things that the Climate Prediction Center is, they look at this thing from the standpoint of anomalies, as if things are linear. And one of the points that Eric made in the last talk, actually, is that they're not linear. And uh, here I've got the actual, this is a, a week old now, but this shows you the actual total sea surface temperature field. And you look and see where the warmest water is. Well, some of it was up here. This is, a, of course, the cause of, of the uh, um, Hurricane Patricia. And then the warmest water remains down in this region here. So that's where the main focus of, of the uh, convergence is occurring, rather than uh, in the anomaly, which is in this region here. And I was tempted to put an equation in here, but I saved you from that. But there is, if one looks at the vorticity e uh, equation, which deals with the rotational part of the flow, which in other words deals with the jet stream, there's a term in there which is the dominant term in the equatorial region. Beta is the gradient of the, of the, uh, of the Coriolis parameter. So this relates to the changing effects of rotation with latitude and then it multiplies the divergent wind outflow. And so this is the north-south component of the wind. And so this is the uh, one month values from 7th of October to the 6th of November. This is the rainfall for that month. And so you can see the anomalous ITCC through here, but there's this heavy rainfall down here where the warmest water was occurring. And then there's the drought over in, in the Indonesian region. And so these are the things which are dominating the, the diabatic heating, the forcing of the atmosphere uh, in the tropics. This is the response in terms of the outgoing long wave radiation. And so you can see the extra rainfall uh, also being reflected here and, and the dry area over here. But this is one of the key things which isn't talked about very much. 
This is the actual divergent outflow in the upper part of the troposphere, uh, somewhere around, what, 200 hectopascals. And so you can see this, the dominant outflow is occurring in association with this guy here, where the heaviest rainfall is occurring. In fact, let me activate something here. This is 10 inches in one month. 10 inches of rainfall, anomalous, in one month in that region here. It's not very big, though, so the size also matters. But there's tremendous outflow in this region, and if you look, in fact, let me go back. Uh, if you look here to see where the biggest north-south component of this outflow is occurring, it's in the southern hemisphere. Well, of course it is, because the southern hemisphere, the winter hemisphere, is where the main outflow tends to go towards. And so that's where the main forcing of the Rossby waves and the jet stream occurs, and it starts to transition around October and then it goes into the northern hemisphere. So there is a component here, and you can see it. You can see this connection up into the southern part of the Americas, up into here. You can see these things here. And so what that does, everywhere there's this long arrow north-south, it's trying to make the flow more anticyclonic, which means it's trying to bend it. And so what that does, if the jet stream is normally coming across here, it tries to bend it down, it bends it down, and it bends it down into California. And so this has already been responsible for some of the weather patterns that we've seen in the last month or two, but it's apt to become worse. And I don't know why people don't talk more about this. I don't know why they don't talk more about the total field rather than simply the anomalies, because in terms of rainfall and the effects on the circulation, you need, the only way you can explain what's going on is in terms of the total field, not just the anomalies. It's not in linear in that regard. And so what, this, is the, this is the expectation then. Northern Hemisphere winter in El Nino, so here's the equator here, is that you've got this extra convection here and actually spreading farther to the east, and that pulls the jet stream down into here. It comes into California, into the southern parts of the U.S., and tracks the storms across the southern parts of the U.S. And, uh, and, that, as those, and, and that's the dominant thing in terms of the forcing of the atmosphere. So that's the anomalous storm track, but that anomalous storm track is then tracking over these very warm water in the north, the, the blob, and it's going to be picking up tremendous amounts of moisture. There's a tremendous risk of, of flooding as a result. So uh, I thought I should say something about decadal variability. This is a relatively short part of the record, and let me... Uh, uh, truncate it to, to highlight the fact that you know during this period here we've had a lot more um, red, a lot more uh, El Nino events, and then maybe in this period here we've had more La Nina events, and now we're transitioning maybe back to, to something else. And this is related to the thing called the, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I, I had this article in Science Magazine, you can download it from my website if you wish, uh, and uh, so this was a figure that was published in that. Uh, and here I've got the global mean temperature record since 1920. And these are seasonal values rather than annual mean values. And the value that's on here, the last value that's on here is, is I think, June or June, July, August. Uh, and then down the bottom here, I've got the decadal values of temperature. You can see the fluctuations. And even here, you can sort of see that often it appears more like a, a stair step rather than a linear thing. And that's related to the decadal variability. And so in the middle here, I've got the thing which is associated with the specific decadal oscillation. This is the pattern of sea surface temperature or surface temperatures associated with the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's very El Nino-like, but a bit broader in the tropics, but it has a very strong extratropical signature. And this time series is actually derived from the region 20 to 70 degrees north in the Pacific, in the North Pacific, so it's focused in this region. Um, there's a, an alternative view of this called the inter, uh, interdecadal, uh, uh, interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, uh, in the, uh, which, is, which is a little more global, because this does clearly have a global signature. And this is the time series of it. And what I've done is to highlight the regimes, the red regimes of positive PDO and the blue regimes, light blue regimes, of the negative PDO. And so you can see this positive uh, region in here from 1976 through to 1998. Positive PDO going into the negative PDO through here through 2013 and now the every indication that we're back in this positive phase of the PDO. Uh, earlier in the record there was a positive phase and, and during the positive phase is when the temperature goes up. 
the heat is closer to the surface in that, cir in that circumstance. It doesn't get buried in the ocean. What the evidence suggests in the negative phase is that the atmospheric, circul uh, the atmospheric circulation, the strong trade winds, and the overturning in the tropics, and even the tally connections into the North Atlantic and the Southern Oceans, tend to push more of the heat down deeper into the ocean. And as a result, it's lost essentially to the surface. It's not lost to the system. There's no lost heat overall, but it's no longer available. And as a result, the expression in terms of surface temperature is not as great. And, and so the Pacific decay oscillation is modulating the global mean temperature. And this is the thing which we think is then primarily responsible for this thing called the, the hiatus, if you, if you want to, uh, want to uh, define it that way. But it's, very, it's got very strong regional characteristics, and it's associated with this PDO pattern. <clears throat> so, uh, just a quick summary then, the energy budget on Earth, the, the ocean heat content data uh, strongly suggests that the ocean loses heat during the lava stages of El Nino. This was very true in 97, 98. There was a tremendous amount of heat that came out of the ocean in 1998. In some sense, instead of just redistributing heat in the 97, 98 event, it overshot and it actually lost heat, and that loss of heat lasted for about five years. It took about five years for the ocean heat content to recover to the pre-1997 values. And so this is the thing which we think kicked the, the, uh, neg kicked the PDO into its negative phase. And then the heat coming out of the ocean is, causes evaporative cooling of the ocean, but it moistens the atmosphere, and so it invigorates all of the storms uh, and it leads to a mini global warming. And then there's a recharge of heat during La Nina but the models do not do this well. We've, we've got a paper submitted to Climate Dynamics, and it suggests that models tend to slosh heat around a lot more, uh, and both in the vertical and in the horizontal, and they don't do this discharge, the diabatic component, the, the discharge and recharge aspects adequately. And so that doesn't give me a lot of faith in, the, in, the, in saying what models do in the future uh, will actually be right. Um, and so this, this is the uh, uh, Eric's, Eric's paper that he went on before, uh, highlighting the, the risk of perhaps more extreme El Nino events. But this is very much dependent upon CMIP-5 models. Some of the key issues in CMIP-5 models, beyond the ones that have already been discussed, are the fact that the thermocline uh, is not at the right level and doesn't behave in the right way. And the intensity of the thermocline is a big issue. And so this relates to how you parameterize ocean mixing. And it doesn't give me a lot of faith that you can say much on what's going to happen with El Nino itself uh, as climate changes. So this is my conclusion. How ENSO itself changes with climate change is not so clear, but it is clear that the consequences, especially the drops and the floods, are going to be much stronger because of the climate change. Yes. In the back? No, take it tomorrow. It, it's, it's Lisa. She can wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, looking for some sort of metaphor or, or analogy for that 200 millibar level exchange of energy that alters the jet stream or extends the jet stream. Uh, is it energy? Is it mass? Is it... What? Well, in, in terms of what I was showing, it was actually related to the vorticity budget, but the other way of thinking about it is in terms of, in terms of the momentum budget. Okay. It's, related to the, it's related to the sort of thing that the handling circulation is normally doing to help the jet stream exist actually where it is, oh. and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's making it uh, more so, and, uh, and, and so that's really what's pulling the jet stream down in that region. But this is certainly one of the key things to keep watching as to see see whether that's uh, happening or not. In, in, in a quick way, can we think of the normal situation and the Hadley cell being shifted to the east of the picture? It's not the total picture, but sort of 
Part yeah, so, so of course in the tropics you've got the heavy circulation, you've got regional monsoons and, and you know the strongest component is usually over Asia and the western Pacific and, and now it becomes a bit more zonal. So there's a, a bit more of a heavy circulation rather than a walker circulation component in the eastern Pacific. So there's a more north-south component than an east-west component. That's part of what's going on. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you,